All right, tonight we are continuing our study in the 66 books series. Um, I do have some handouts for you. Luke and Jacob are, are going to pass these out. We were having some technical difficulties this morning with uh, the slides, and so here's a, just a basic outline for where we're going tonight. As we study the book of Joshua, Joshua, the sixth book in your Bible, and we'll get, as we have been getting each of these uh, nights, just a broad overview of what God is doing in, in this book in your Bible. So we are coming out of the Pentateuch, the first five books of the canon. And now we finally jump into book number six, written by someone other than Moses. Now, let me just remind you, if you open your Bibles back to Deuteronomy chapter 4. It was forbidden for anyone to add to these words. The revelation that God had given to Moses was complete. It was sufficient for everything that God's people needed. And therefore, any addition would be an alteration, would be a way to diminish the perfectly given word that the people received through Moses. Just look at chapter 4 of Deuteronomy, verse 1. So now, O Israel, listen to the statutes and the judgments which I am teaching you to do so that you may live and go in and take possession of the land which Yahweh, the God of your fathers, is giving you. You shall not add to this word which I am commanding you, nor take away from it, that you may keep the commandments of Yahweh, your God, which I am commanding you. As Moses is finishing his life, his ministry with Israel, he is putting them just on the edge of the land to go in. And he tells them that the very things they're supposed to be hearing from him, the statutes, judgments that he's teaching them to do, it was for the purpose that they might live and go in and take possession of the land. God's law served that purpose. But to do that, to adequately obey that word, coming under submission to that word, require them to not alter that word in any way. Verse 2, you shall not add to the word which I am commanding you, nor take away from it, again, so that you may keep the commandments of Yahweh your God, which I am commanding you today. The implication there is that to add or take away from any part of God's word would make obedience impossible. Anyone who altered God's word in any way, that could be a formal way by saying, I have a word of the Lord, just like Moses received the word from the Lord, I have another word. That would be one way of adding to God's word or even writing down what you believe God is saying and putting it in conjunction with the Torah. That would have been a formal way to do that. We, we do this more informally probably by just amending the meaning of what God said, all of those things would have been prohibited from this injunction to not add to the word or take away from it. Don't alter it in any way. In fact, this is not the last time that this is mentioned. Just flip over to Proverbs 30. Here we are in the wisdom literature. And the same thing is mentioned. Proverbs chapter 30, verse 6. Do not add to his words. There's the command. 
And then with, with this caution, lest he rebuke you and you be found a liar. The one who speaks only truth and all truth to amend that truth in any way, you leave yourself in a position of only being found a liar. And then obviously at the end of your Bible in Revelation, you've got the same thing to finish the canon, to not alter God's words. So this is a repeated command to not amend or tamper with God's words. But here we are after Moses, just flip over to Joshua chapter one, and we encounter this very thing happening, addition to God's words, more revelation inscripturated for us. Joshua 1.1, now it came about after the death of Moses, so Moses is off the scene, no longer writing, he's the servant of Yahweh, that Yahweh spoke, this is again, now to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' attendant. And then we have God's words recorded in the same way that Moses' words, God's words were recorded through Moses. So here we have this addition. What's the What are we seeing here? While it is prohibited from anyone, any person to add to God's words, God himself can only add to God's words. And he did that here. God added to his own word now, not through Moses, but through a different servant, Joshua. And so we get additional scriptures equally authoritative, equally sufficient, equally clear to what was formerly revealed. Who is this man who's now recording additional revelation, receiving additional words from the same God of Moses, whom Moses served? Well, he's none other than than Joshua. Verse 1, Yahweh spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun. He is none other than the son of Nun. Just flip back, we'll we'll look briefly at who this man is, because he is not new to this record. Flip back to Exodus chapter 17. The first time that Joshua appears, he is doing what he's known for in the book of Joshua, and that is fighting. Exodus 17, verse 9, or verse 8. This is just before they reached Sinai. Then Amalek came and fought against Israel at Rephidim. So Moses said to Joshua, choose men for us and go out, fight against Amalek. Tomorrow I will take my stand on the top of the hill with the staff of God in my hand. And Joshua did as Moses told him to fight against Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. So it happened when Moses raised his hand up that Israel prevailed, and when he let his hand down, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands were heavy. Then they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it, and Aaron and Hur supported his hands, one on one side and one on the other. Thus his hands were steady until the sunset. So Joshua overwhelmed Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. Then Yahweh said to Joshua, write this in a book. Moses wrote the Torah as a memorial and recited in Joshua's hearing that I will utterly blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. So here we're introduced to Joshua in the Torah as one who fights for Israel, who leads under Moses' command to fight for Israel, to lead Israel out in war. And he was one who heard the word of Yahweh that Moses wrote down. When Moses wrote this in a book, he recited it in the hearing of Joshua. So Joshua fights for God, Joshua hears God. Flip over to 24, Exodus 24, we encounter Joshua again under a similar title as we've already heard. He's one who serves 
the servant of Yahweh, Moses, 24.3, or excuse me, uh, 24.13. So Moses arose with Joshua, his attendant, and Moses went up to the mountain of God. So all of these times that Moses is going uh, back and forth, up and down the mountain, Joshua presumably is with Moses. So Joshua is one who got a front row seat into the revelation that Moses experienced with God. He's there on Sinai, on the mountain of God, as Moses receives the revelation between chapters 24 all the way to 32. And in 32, Joshua appears again. He's the one that astutely points out what's happening after Moses receives this revelation from God. They're coming down from the mountain. And in Exodus 32, verse 17, then Joshua heard the sound of the people as they shouted. This is around the idolatrous golden calf. And he said to Moses, there is a sound of war in the camp. But he said, it is not the sound of the cry of triumph, nor is it the sound of the cry of defeat, but the sound of singing I hear. This man familiar with war recognized this is not the sound of war. They are throwing a party. They go down. They see the idolatry. When God separates from his people for a time, the, the tent of meeting being outside of the midst of Israel because of the idolatry that they've committed, then this is also recorded about Joshua. As Moses is going back and forth from the tent to the people, Exodus 33, 11 says, Thus Yahweh used to speak to Moses face to face, just as a man speaks to his friend. That's unique. Then Moses would return to the camp and his attendant, Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, would not depart from the tent. So this is just along the way, Moses gives us a glimpse into the person of Joshua, who this young man is. He is one who is acquainted with war, who hears the word of God, who ministers to God's servant, who's even watchful in a, in a sense over God's people, but he has a desire to be near the presence of God. He's in Numbers 13 with Caleb, a faithful spy. And if we just fast forward one more time past the rebellious nation, all the way to Deuteronomy chapter one, the first generation is off the scene then this is what God tells Moses, since Moses is not going into the promised land. He's made that clear. Deuteronomy 1 verse 38 says this, God, Yahweh tells Moses, Joshua, the son of Nun, who stands before you, he shall enter there, enter the land. Strengthen him, for he will cause Israel to inherit it. This is Joshua, this is God's plan for Joshua's life. He will be the one to lead the people finally into the promised land. And so what do we find out about this remarkable book? Joshua, we've already been told uh, in a sense from God in Deuteronomy through Moses. But what Joshua reveals in all 24 chapters is this. Here's the purpose. Joshua records God's faithfulness to Israel in miraculously giving them the land of Canaan after Moses' death. It is a simple purpose that this book has. It's singular in its aim, singular in its focus. Everything supports that one goal, that one purpose. It's simply a recording of God's faithfulness to Israel to do this, to miraculously give them the land of Canaan post Moses, after Moses' death. If we were to get a big picture view of Joshua, just in four parts, here's what we would have. We would have the beginning of Joshua, 
The first five chapters are just preparation to enter into the land. It's just preparatory work. The first five chapters. Joshua takes charge and sort of takes the reins from Moses. The book opens, as we saw in chapter one, verse one, with Moses' death. And God is no longer speaking to Joshua, uh, to Moses, but rather God is now speaking to Joshua. So Joshua assumes command of the people. This time he sends in spies just like Moses, but he only sends in two spies, the same number of spies that came back with a faithful report. Joshua says, let's just send in two this time. They come back with a faithful report. In chapters three and four, they cross the Jordan and set up a memorial to remember what God did. And what we see happening in this preparation is that God is exalting Joshua before the people, just as he exalted Moses before the people so that they would fear or believe Joshua just as they did Moses. And so you encounter similar miracles at time, most notably this miracle in chapters three and four, just a summary is given at the end of chapter three. And the priests who carried the ark of the covenant of Yahweh, this is chapter three, verse 17, they stood firm on dry ground in the middle of the Jordan while all Israel crossed on dry ground until all the nation had completed crossing the Jordan. This is reminiscent of the Red Sea. The Red Sea, the waters parted, Israel crossed on dry ground. Here, while the Jordan's rivers, the waters are overflowing the banks, as soon as the priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant venture to approach the River Jordan to cross into the land of Canaan, what happens? The waters dry up and stand at a city far, far back from where they're crossing. If you would have been in any of those cities along the way, just uh, further north of the Jordan, uh, along the Jordan, to see waters dry up and stand tall in a heap, to be able to look into the distance and see the waters of the Jordan standing up while you're looking at the river immediately dry, this was an undeniable proof, a miracle demonstrating Everything y'all heard about Canaanites happening in Egypt, it's happening again. The same God is at work through a different servant for this purpose. He is bringing his people into the land. In chapter five, this is also preparatory because they've got to circumcise. This is a reminder of the covenant that they had with Yahweh. The people must be circumcised or a sign of purification, really, before they enter into the land. This is common, uncircumcision in the land. You're going to go into that land. You are called out. You are to be different. You have a different God. You have a different way of worship. You have a different law. You must have a different sign of the covenant as well. So they're purified, and then, only then, can they enter into the land. And that's the first five chapters, all preparation. What you get in chapters 6 to 12, really seven chapters, cover the conquest. That's less than a third of the book of Joshua to give you the details of the conquest. As I'm sure you know, Jericho is first. And this bizarre way of conquering the city that they would march around it, Another way of God showing that ultimately the battle is his, not Israel. It's not in their wisdom that they're going to conquer this. It's not by their wise war tactics that this land is going to be conquered, but it's through God's own hand, miraculously so. So walls that should not have been able to be knocked down are walked down. And throughout, you get miracle after miracle as this little band, really, of 
people in Israel continually conquer king after king, kingdom after kingdom. The only times that they're losing any battles is the result of their own disobedience. And we'll come back to that. That's chapter 7. The sun stands still in chapter 10 until all God's enemies have been vanquished. Another undeniable proof that God is the God of creation. Those things that the Canaanites worshiped, like the heavenly bodies, the sun, they don't work for them. Their gods cannot control them. They're all subject to the one true God, Yahweh, who fights for Israel. And that just takes us all the way through the conquest. We get in chapter 12, just a recounting of all that's been conquered. And then it ends with this statement in verse 24 of Joshua 13. In all, 31 kings. 31 kings in the land. City after city, kingdom after kingdom conquered by a people that was a nobody. They were nothing. And yet they conquered this land, 31 kings. Just notice at the beginning, just after the recounting of everything that they conquered, that would be uh, to the east of the Jordan under Moses' leadership, to the west of the Jordan in Canaan under Joshua's leadership. Once all of that's recounted, lest anyone was confused that we were done, chapter 13, verse 1 begins with these words. Now Joshua was old, advanced in years, and Yahweh said to him, you are old, advanced in years, and very much of the land remains to be possessed. They're not finished. They're not done. Very much of the land remains to be possessed. And that's what you have on your outline in those two uh, maps, kind of hard to make out in the black and white. But on the left, all of the land that was conquered, perhaps you can see even the uh, tribal names. You've got Manasseh there in the middle, Ephraim to the south, Benjamin, then Judah, and then Simeon. That would have been out of the, outside the land of Canaan. Simeon, south there, then Reuben, just east of the Dead Sea, the Salt Sea, and then back up north, you have Gad, then the half-tribe of Manasseh, uh, Naphtali and Dan are, are up above north, and so they each had an allotment that we'll talk about in a second, but to the right, that right map that you see there on the, on the notes, what's sort of outlined in the middle, that's all of Israel. What's outside of those boundaries, that highlighted portion, to the east and to the west is enemy territory. That's the land that remains to be conquered. God promised Abraham all the land of Canaan. Abraham traversed during his lifetime that land, didn't own anything except a single field, but God told him the land is for you and for your descendants. In Numbers 34, Moses outlines the boundaries. You have seas, S-E-A-S, all around there's, that's their inheritance. Here, we see that they did not conquer sea to sea. They did not conquer everything that they were to be given. This is why the book of Judges, not to get too far ahead, but Judges opens with a recounting of who got what and what they didn't finish conquering which is why the angel of Yahweh shows up in Judges chapter 2, and he says this to them. Look at Judges chapter 2, verse 1. Then the angel of Yahweh came up from Gilgal to Bochum, 
And he said, to, and he said I brought you up out of the land, out of Egypt, and led you into the land which I have sworn to your fathers. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you. Just notice who is saying these things. The angel of Yahweh. I brought you out of the land of Egypt. I led you into the land which I have sworn to your fathers. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you. The angel of Yahweh is the one who's been doing this all along. He's been leading them, rescuing them, safely providing for them. He made the covenants. This is evident from the Torah, if you read carefully. But he says in verse 2, And as for you, you shall cut no covenant with the inhabitants of this land. You shall tear down their altars, but you have not listened to my voice. What is this you have done? Therefore, I also said, I will not drive them out before you, but they will become as thorns in your sides, and their gods will become a snare to you. And he goes on. So the angel of Yahweh acknowledges that they have not obeyed. Joshua brought them into the land. They successfully, so long as they were obedient, were taking over the land, and then they ceased to obey God. And so the land was not conquered by them. There is remaining territory. Why do you have less than a third of the book devoted to the specific details of conquering the land? Well, several reasons. One of them, though, is that just the conquest of the land is not primarily what the land is about or what the book is about. It's not just about them getting, getting into the land and taking over a part of it. That's significant. It demonstrates God's great faithfulness to do what he promised when his people obeyed him. But that's not the end. Just to acquire a portion of the land. Notice the third point, if we divided this big picture into a third portion, you basically get nine chapters devoted to the division of the land, how it was divided up. It's not the conquest that matters as much as the inheritance. It's not getting into the land and winning the land. It's actually keeping the land, inheriting the land all the way that matters. And just as an aside, that's a lesson for us, right? Um, to make a profession, to experience some victory is not the end for us. To actually persevere and lay hold of what God has, to lay hold of his promises all the way to the end, to uh, finish the race as it were, that is the goal. I think that's illustrative just in the, the amount of ink devoted to which portions of the book. The divisions of the land uh, went beyond what they had actually conquered. Joshua, by lot, God chooses by lot this random practice, so to speak, divides the land, and then he says, now go get it. This belongs to you. God has given it to you. You just have to obey. It's yours for the taking. And they refused. Joshua gives a farewell address. The, the final two chapters were counting their history and urging them on. He was already aware that these words would fall on deaf ears. You can, when you get a chance, go back, read Deuteronomy 31 and 32. 32 is that famous song of Moses that just, Moses writes the song, teaches the people the song in the same day, because it's going to be a testimony against them when the words of that prophetic song come to pass. You didn't listen to Yahweh. You refused to obey him. He was only ever good, and you failed. 
you refuse, you are hard-hearted and stubborn. Joshua was privy to those things. He was with Moses, so he knew this conquest is going to occur, but the people will not succeed. They will not continue. They will not last. And so he gives his final words uh, to the people that he knows will not carry out the mission. If we think about just thematically for for a minute, uh, what themes emerge uh, from the pages of this book? If you just read and just let the book tell you, as we should, what it's primarily about, here are some of the themes. Excuse me. You get this book of the law talked about time and time again. From the opening of Joshua, the book of the law is in view. Look at chapter 1, verse 8. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it, for then you will make your way successful, and then you will be prosperous. Chapter 8, verse 31 Joshua builds an altar on Mount Ebal. Just as Moses, the servant of Yahweh, had commanded the sons of Israel, as it is written in the book of the law of Moses, an altar of uncut stones on which no man is wielded an iron tool, etc. So the altar, how to build the altars outlined in the book of Moses. Verse 34, then afterward he read all the words of the law the blessing and the curse according to all that is written in the book of the law. Chapter 22, verse 5. Only keep yourselves very carefully to do the commandment and the law which Moses, the servant of Yahweh, commanded you to love Yahweh your God and walk in, his, in all his ways and keep his commandments and cling to him and serve him with all your heart and with all your soul. This is the law of Moses. They were given the commandments in that law. And so Moses and his law are constantly in view. If you just look at the fourth theme there in your notes, Moses mentioned dozens of times. Moses doesn't lose prominence after his death. And if you're reading your Old Testament carefully, he never loses prominence. (laughs) Throughout the Old Testament, they're always drawing back on what Moses has said. All roads lead back to the Torah. In your Bible, all roads lead back to your Torah. You want to read your Old Testament better? Familiarize yourself with the Torah. You want to read your New Testament better? Familiarize yourself with the Torah. It will make your Old and New Testament clearer if you know what Moses has said. God's attributes, obviously, on display. His faithfulness, for starters. God's faithfulness. Again, from the beginning of the book, God's faithfulness is on display. He is actually doing what he promised in bringing them into the land. Look again, if you're uh, near chapter 23, verse 5. And Yahweh your God, he will thrust them out from before you, these other nations, and dispossess them before you, and you will possess their land just as Yahweh your God promised you. God is faithful. Will you be faithful to him? Verse 10. One of your men will pursue 1,000, for Yahweh your God is he who fights for you just as he promised you. Again, a fulfillment of God's promise. Verse 14, now behold, today, Joshua says, I am going the way of all the earth, and you know in all your hearts and in all your souls that not one word of all the good words which Yahweh your God spoke concerning you has failed. All has has all have come to pass for you, not one word of them has failed. And then 15, 
And it will be that just as all the good words which Yahweh your God spoke to you have come upon you, so Yahweh will bring upon you all the calamitous words until he has destroyed you from off this good land which Yahweh your God has given you. When you trespass against the covenant of Yahweh your God, which he commanded you, and go and serve other gods and bow down to them, then the anger of Yahweh will burn against you, and you will perish quickly from off the good land which he has given you. God is faithful. He is faithful to bless. He is faithful to curse. God is faithful. He cannot deny himself, Paul says. He is faithful. That in itself has implications uh, for us as we think about endurance, as we think about perseverance, as we think about going beyond just a victory or two as Christians. God is faithful to you, Christian. God is faithful. God is faithful to bless those who fear him. He is faithful to curse those who do not. God's presence is another attribute on display. He talks about being with you, with you, with you, uh, with Joshua, with his people time and again. God's sovereignty as well, just clearly on display as he is the one orchestrating all of these events, speaking to Joshua at times even about battle strategies, uh, instilling fear in the nations. God is overseeing all of these activities. Uh, Jerusalem, interestingly enough, before God had designated Jerusalem as a significant city, it still comes up in the book of Joshua. It's almost like as God is telling Joshua what to record, he's got Jerusalem on his mind. Even before he's made it clear to Israel that this is going to be the city where his name dwells forever. It's just an interesting feature uh, so long before God through David, designates Jerusalem as his holy city. Uh, We talked about Moses playing a prominent role. This idea, also number five, of rest. Rest. Just flip back to chapter one, verse 13. Remember the word which Moses, the servant of Yahweh, commanded you, saying, Yahweh your God gives you rest and will give you this land. There you have rest and the land tied together. To give them rest... Uh, bring them comfortably and peacefully to this land where he would vanquish their enemies and make them dwell at peace without fear. The land produced in a way that was supernatural, almost beyond their work and without their work, the land would yield its fruit. That's a quality of this rest that's in view. Verse 15, until Yahweh gives your brothers rest, those tribes that were on the east of the Jordan, as he gives you, and they also possess the land which Yahweh your God is giving them, talking about the other tribes, nine and a half tribes. So the the land is tied to this rest. Look at chapter 11, verse 23. As the conquest is coming to an end, verse 23 in chapter 11 says, So Joshua took the whole land according to all that Yahweh had spoken to Moses, and Joshua gave it for an inheritance to Israel according to their divisions by their tribes. Thus the land was quiet from war. It's a picture of rest, not having to fight because their enemies are gone. Again, a characteristic of the rest that's in view. Verse 14, or excuse me, verse 15 in chapter 14. Now the name of Hebron was formerly Kiriath Arba, for Arba was the greatest man among the Anakim. Then the land was quiet from war. Picture of rest. Chapter 22, verse 4. And now Yahweh your God has given rest to your brothers as he spoke to them. So now turn and go to your tents, to the land of your possession, which Moses, the servant of Yahweh, gave you beyond the Jordan. You'll notice this term beyond the Jordan when Moses uses that term, since they're not crossed over into Canaan, they're on the east side. 
beyond the Jordan means in Canaan. Uh, when he records about leaving Egypt and going toward the promised land, beyond the Jordan is in Canaan. Where here, since they're in Canaan, beyond the Jordan is the other side, east of Jordan, beyond the Jordan. But this is rest that they have. They have a fruitful land and respite from war. Two phenomenal features of rest. If you remember when we studied Zechariah, uh, Zephaniah, same thing was in view. Uh, they had rest. He will give you rest on every side. That's the same idea here. They were brought safely into the land. Their enemies were gone. And the land produced. And then six and seven, the six and seven themes, just to note, Yahweh, the God of Israel, is repeated time and again. That's important because he, Yahweh has bound himself by unilateral covenant to Israel. And so he is called the God of Israel. When they're obedient or not, he is still the God of Israel. The same ethnic people that descended from Abraham and Jacob, i.e. Israel. He remains their God. And then finally, you'll see, I think, the most prominent uh, feature, at least by word count, is the land the land, some 158 references to the land, the land, the land. The land is important. The land is important to God. The land should be important to us. The land. This is not any land. This is not America. This is the land, the land of Canaan, the land that was promised to Abraham. Just go back to Genesis 17 for a moment, and then we'll look at a couple lessons that we need to learn as we hone in on the land. Look what God tells Abraham before he even has given him a son. He assures him again that he will have this son. And he says in verse 8, and I will give to you and to your seed after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. Some interesting language happening here so long ago to Abraham. Yahweh is the one speaking, but just notice in verse one, Yahweh isn't just speaking, but Yahweh has appeared to Abram and said. Those are two different verbs. The speaking verb is second, he said, but the verb that comes first is he's appeared. He has physically manifested himself to Abram. So Abraham, in some way, saw God when God spoke this word to him. And when God appeared and spoke, he said, I am God Almighty. Do this, walk before me and be blameless. That's the command. Walk before me and be blameless. And then he lays out the covenant again for him with these details, one of which we read in verse eight. I, Yahweh, who has appeared to you and who is speaking to you, will give you and your seed. That's Two groups, Abram, seed. Give them what? The land of your, Abram's sojournings, all the land of Canaan, not for a temporary possession, but for an everlasting one. This covenant, this detail of the covenant endures. And he says, I will be not your God, but their God, the God of your seed. Interesting. So here, uh, uh, a promise for Abram and Abraham's descendants that he will be their God and he will give them this land. Why is that important? If you just look at the references in Joshua, it's important because this is in perfect keeping with the promise that God has made, that they're finally entering into the land. 
By the way, this word, according to one scholar, is the fifth most used word in your Bible, in your Old Testament. Eretz, land. The land is important. Uh, Yahweh, king, son, and land are in the top five words used in your Old Testament. The land is important. Here's one reason why that's important. I think this is one of the lessons that Joshua teaches us. Number one, Joshua reveals the way into the promised land. Joshua, the book, reveals the way into the promised land. We've already gotten glimpses of it in Genesis, even what we just read, what God calls Abraham to walk before me and be blameless. As one who has heard me speak, believe me and live this way. That would be a succinct way of describing that. But go back to Joshua chapter 1, verse 8, and I'll just show you really briefly what I mean about Josh revealing the way into the promised land. Practically, how do you get there? You, you've already spied out the land. You're looking at the Jordan. You have a, a map of some sort. You can walk there. But what's the way into the land? Here it is. He, he spells it out. Let's jump back to verse 6 in Joshua 1. Be strong and courageous, for you shall cause this people to inherit the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous. To be careful to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Does it take courage and strength to obey God? Say yes. Yes, it does. It takes courage to obey God. Do not turn aside from it to the right or to the left so that you may be prosperous wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way successful, and then you will be prosperous. This is the way. This is the way. A prosperous, a successful way. Where are they going? Into the promised land. This is what it requires of you. What's the way? How do you get there? How do you ensure a successful way? Don't let the book of the law depart from your mouth, but meditate on it. He doesn't say don't let it depart from your mind, but meditate on it. Don't let it depart from your mouth. In other words, if it reaches your lips, then it's in your heart. You got the mind covered if it's in your mouth. So what is biblical meditation? It's keeping the word on your tongue, keeping the word in your mouth reciting God's words, speaking God's words. Speak the truth to your own heart. Speak the truth to one another. And in this way, you will ensure that you and one another successfully enter into the promised land. Look at what the psalmist does. Go to Psalm 1. We studied this recently in 414. Just a tremendous passage about the destiny of, How to ensure your own destiny ends in the promised land. What's the way there? I want you to see something. Just jump to the end of Psalm 1. Yahweh knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. This way. What's the way? The way. Notice at the end of Psalm 2. Kiss the son lest he become angry and you perish in the way. For his wrath may soon be kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. There's a curse for some. They perish on the way when their way perishes. This is about the destiny of all men. There's somewhere that all men are headed. That's the way that they're on. 
Some are headed into this promised land that God's promised, Abraham and his faithful descendants. Some are not. The way of those people perishes. So who is the blessed one? Well, the blessed one is the one who takes refuge in the sun, according to Psalm 212. But look back at Psalm 1. Who is the blessed man? Well, he's the blessed man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, who does not stand in the way of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. He doesn't stand in the way of sinners. What does he do? Well, his delight is in the law of Yahweh, and in his law he meditates day and night. That is pulled directly from Joshua 1.8. Who's the blessed man? Joshua is the blessed man who did not let the word depart from his mouth, but meditated on it day and night. And everyone else who follows Joshua, where's Joshua going? Into the promised land, the land promised to the fathers, promised to Abraham. All of God's promises were bound up in the land. If you doubt that, just flip over to Proverbs 2. Who gets to see the land? Solomon picks up on the same theme, tells his son to heed wisdom. Why? Proverbs 2, 20. So you will walk in the way of the good, that is of those who are good, and keep to the paths of the righteous, those well-worn tracks of those who God deems righteous. Why is that so important? Well, it's because the upright, not everybody, but the upright will inhabit the land and those with integrity remain in it. But the wicked will be cut off from the land and the treacherous will be rooted out of it. The way, the way to successfully reach God's promises found one day ultimately in the land, Jerusalem, Canaan, the way to get there, Don't let the word depart from your mouth. Meditate on it. So how well are you doing, Christian, at meditating on God's word, at rehearsing it with your mouth, with your speech? Are you memorizing scripture so that your heart can be filled with the comforts that scripture gives, that it can be filled with the encouragement that scripture offers, that it can be familiar with the commands that God gives so that you can submit to the law that's given. How are you doing at that? The one who is diligent to heed God's words in that way, drawing near to those words constantly with a believing heart, he will ensure that his way is prosperous, just as Joshua did. So Joshua in that way reveals the way into the promised land. This is faith-filled confidence in God's words. Faith-filled submission to God's law. Number two, Joshua reveals the way out of the promised land. I'm running out of time here. You can write down Joshua 7. Achan, one man among all of the congregation, disobeyed God, and he did not remain in the land. He was removed shaken, if you will, out of the land. And that term comes up over and over in your Bible, to be moved, removed, shaken. Those who are treacherous will not remain in the land. Joshua 7, 26, Then they raised over him a great heap of stones that stands to this day, and Yahweh turned from his burning anger. Therefore, the name of that place has been called the Valley of Accor to this day. This is what happened to Achan as a result of his disobedience, this being rooted out of the land. It's a a picture of what Solomon describes that we've already read in Proverbs 2. The wicked will be cut off from the land and the treacherous will be rooted out of it. Something, Something else to just note, how... Much is God's glory tied to bringing Israel safely and finally into 
everything that he's promised them? Well, Joshua realizes this in chapter 7. In chapter 7, verse 9, he says, as he is lamenting this defeat, seeing that God is no longer with them and he does not know why, he says, and the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land will hear of it and they will surround us and cut us off or cut off our name from the earth. And then he says this, and what Yahweh will you do for your great name? In other words, if you don't bring us into the promised land, if we are defeated, if Israel is obliterated and loses ultimately and doesn't inherit the promises that you gave, then what will you do for your great name? Whether or not Israel gets what God promised as he promised it so long ago, that is a matter of God's name being upheld of God being glorified. In other words, if God doesn't give the promises as he promised them, if if Moses and Joshua and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and the patriarchs, if their faith was misplaced and they don't get the land that they traversed in their lifetime, then what will God do for his great name? He has failed. Those promises ought to be taken literally, not spiritualized. We should take them this way. Those who do not reach the land are those who are treacherous, who do not walk before God with integrity. Proverbs 10.30 reiterates this same principle. The righteous will never be removed, but the wicked will not dwell in the land. Lastly, thirdly, The lesson to learn from Joshua, Joshua reveals the one who safely leads his people into the promised land. I should have saved more time for this, but Joshua 5, just go back to Joshua 5. This is, they've all been purified through circumcision. Day before they enter into Jericho and start this campaign to conquer the land, And what does Joshua see? Now it happened when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted up his eyes and looked and behold, a man was standing opposite him with his sword drawn in his hand. Not really what you want to see the day before the battle is some random guy with a sword in his hand. Joshua was on edge. He went to him and said to him, are you for us? or for our adversaries. One question, all I need to know, we can end this now. The man said, verse 14, no, neither. Rather, I indeed, I myself come now as commander of the host or army of Yahweh. And Joshua knows as one familiar with the law, knows what this is, knows what's happening. He fell on his face to the earth and bowed down and said to him, what is my Lord to say to his slave? I get it. I know who you are. You're the commander of the army. You're the you're the, the angel that went before us in Exodus 23 that Moses wrote about. God's name is in you. You've been the one leading us safely into the land. You've been the commander of this army. What do you want from me? One thing, the commander of the host or the army of Yahweh said to Joshua, remove your sandals from your feet for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. This is Exodus 3 at the burning bush all over again. The same angel that appeared to Moses in the burning bush that has been safely subduing Israel's enemies, protecting them in the wilderness, ensuring that they see the land. He's here again to lead his people and lead Joshua to lead his people into the land. When Jesus says in John 5 and Luke 24 that Moses wrote of me, that the prophets speak of him, this is one of those times 
This is none other than the pre-incarnate Christ doing what he's always done, leading his, faith, his people faithfully where God is directing them to go. He is the one who Joshua said fights for Israel, and he is here to go before them in battle. To, to know this one, to trust this one, to be on this way and trusting oneself to this one, all those who do that, all those who follow this same one, who follow this Christ, this messenger of God who is God, who speaks for God, who speaks as God, all who take refuge in him, as we saw in Psalm 2, are blessed. You, Christian, are blessed if this is the one that you have taken refuge in. If you have fled to this same person in the person of Jesus Christ, who was so long after this encounter with Joshua, crucified for sinners, rose for sinners, and now sits at the right hand of God, just waiting for all of his enemies to be put under his feet. If you have fled to that one for refuge, then you are safe. And you too, like Joshua, will one day see the land. That's where our hope is. Don't trust in any other thing. Don't trust in any other one, but in this one. Draw near to his word, know his word, and entrust yourself to his care so that you too will safely see the promised land when his kingdom comes. Let me pray for us. God, thank you so much for this book. To just have for us so many details recorded so that we might know your faithfulness even as you, as God in heaven, as the Father, have entrusted your own glory to your Son, to this messenger who mediates it through faithful servants, we're reminded that we can trust your word. We can trust you to see us safely into your kingdom when it comes. And God, we do pray that you would bring your kingdom your kingdom come, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And until you see fit to rescue us and bring us into that kingdom, then we pray that we would preach this kingdom to everyone who would listen, that we would encourage and comfort one another as that day approaches, and that you would make us strong and courageous to obey you and whatever you have for us until you come or until you take us to be with you. And we ask all these things. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.